You're listening to KTAL LP 101.5, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Good morning and welcome to Take on Faith. I am your host, Rev. Kalani Kachela, or XK. Each week we'll explore matters of faith, spirituality, and current issues affecting our experience of the human condition. We'll have a thought-provoking guest on each episode. Thank you for joining me. Let's jump right on in. Good morning. My sense is that if you're listening to community radio here in Las Cruces, in all likelihood you are a person who is well-informed and stays on top of community events, state events, of course national events affecting Americans, and then the global situation. And this week the global situation has turned quite fraught as the Russian military invaded Ukraine. It wasn't a surprise. In fact, U.S. intelligence reported the day before the attack was imminent and advised Russian, I'm sorry, Ukrainian citizens to be prepared for an attack from all sides of the nation. President Joseph Biden issued a strong statement to Americans and to the world about diplomacy and the efforts that the U.S. has made with um, Russian diplomats trying to convince the president of Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin, to back down and to retreat and not to initiate this war of choice upon Ukraine. So Americans have been watching um, with their eyes wide open for the last several months, in fact, as Russians amounted troops, tanks, military artillery, um, supplies, aircraft, support battalions um, all around Ukraine as a show of force and a show of um, their intent to invade the country. And on Friday morning, um, word came that the Russian army had actually invaded Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, and that the Russian forces were headed into the government, the central government of Ukraine, um, hoping to, we don't say hoping to, but uh, appears to have the intent of taking over the government and consolidating Russian power. I bring this up today because this is an issue for all people, including people of faith. And I like to spend a few moments just considering the notion of how people of faith might understand geopolitics or perhaps not understand geopolitics. And pursue the question of what can people of faith, people of spiritual convictions do in a time such as this, and how do they understand the world and perhaps their role in it? These are questions that have been on my mind for a long time, and they require some deep thinking, I believe, to understand um, what might be the underpinnings of most faith perspectives when it comes to geopolitics. My gut instinct is that in most houses of faith around the U.S., war and military actions that affect Americans probably are unspoken. I've been to many churches throughout my lifetime um, as a Christian, as a Unitarian Universalist, and as a kind of objective observer during times of war, and I've heard virtually nothing from the pulpit about how Christians or Buddhist Jews, 
Catholics, Muslims, people of earth religions and so forth can respond in these times. In fact, perhaps the only time that I have in my lifetime seen a groundswell of religious fervor following a military event a military event was after the attacks on 911 as most of us remember during those days and following the attacks on the World Trade Center September 11 2001 churches were full of um, people looking for solace and comfort and some word from clergy how they may respond or what might they do or what was the meaning of all this. I do recall attending a church the Sunday following 911. That was in Dallas at the time. I attended a church at um, First United Methodist of Duncanville. It's funny how your mind can remember even those types of details um, 21 years later almost. Let's say 20 years later. Um, I remember going to the church, which was um, about typically on a typical Sunday, about maybe 150 people that day. The place was virtually full. Maybe 500 people were in the house. And it's probably important to begin some of this conversation or dialogue by just naming what has taken place and that is the Russian military um, attacked Ukraine a couple days ago and they have in their sights a consolidation of Russian power or a reestablishment of the former Soviet Union type of, of um, leadership in the world. It's um, clear that the Soviet Union, Soviet Union has dissipated over the last several decades. And in its aftermath, um, Russian power on the world scene is diminished. There's still a significant power in the world, but not the global block of power that they were before the Soviet Union dissolved. We can trace the current action, military action, back to Vladimir Putin's um, early time as a Russian spy, I guess you would call him. Um, he worked for the department in the Russian government that was aligned with, say, the FBI in, in America or the CIA. Um, some component of an intelligence was where he um, cut his teeth and he aspired to um, be the type of person who would always keep Russian the, the plum, Russian importance on the world stage um, as a significantly important and one who sought to, to make sure that Russia had a dominant position on the world stage. That's probably a better way to say it. Um, Putin had hoped to be um, posted as a person in that intelligence field in a place in the world that was um, significant. Instead, he ended up in Dresden, Germany, kind of a outpost with very little significance. And as a consequence of that, he watched Soviet Union crumble and Experts say, as a consequence of that, had significant um, shame and embarrassment, personal embarrassment, and felt helpless and developed an enormous amount of resent toward America in particular because, in his mind, America or the American government was the cause of the demise of the Soviet Union. And um, as a consequence of that, he developed a personal mission and a professional mission that 
given a chance, he would get revenge, not only on America, but also um, reestablish the Soviet Union as a world power. And we've seen um, history play out such that we can see that Vladimir Putin has made the, I guess, the building block of a renewed Soviet power by taking on um, Crimea, Crimea, where he annexed in 2014 and has since um, kind of drawn a line in the sand saying that Russia is bound to reestablish itself in the world. And Vladimir Putin has um, announced that he will himself be that world leader that he once was. People will wonder, well, how does this happen in a country that is supposedly um, democratic or one that has a foundation of capitalism and partnership around the EU and the global economy? In fact, um, Putin came into power and was handpicked by Boris Yeltsin, who suddenly resigned his post as president of the of Russia. So there was no election. There was no um, democratic process that we in America know as the way people become, become um, world leaders or national leaders, state leaders or any type of leader. There was no election process that took place. It was simply handpicked. And... From the moment he was selected by Boris Yeltsin, um, he went into work to reestablish Russia as a world leader. And probably more important to note that he went right to work to establish himself as a world leader who could get things done. One who was um, politically astute, one who was physically astute. Um, one who was um, charismatic, intelligent, connected, and, of course, all-powerful to make Russians understand him as their premier leader without question. What made Putin so radically different than most world leaders is that In case you just joined us, you're listening to Take on Faith on KTAL LP 101.5 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm your host, Kalani Kachela. I'm a UU minister based here in Las Cruces. Today we're talking about how the geopolitical situation that arises out of the Russian-Ukrainian war that commenced two days ago, three days ago, impacts people of faith and how people of faith might respond. It's important to note that aside from Putin's political aspirations, it has been said that um, he has some aspirations to um, rebuild Christendom. Christendom is a word that has really fallen out of favor in the last several decades. Um, If you're a person who has attended seminary or spent significant time studying spiritual matters, maybe uh, religion in university or college, you probably have heard a term, but it typically refers to the fact that Christianity is the faith of the world and that um, we live in a Christian world. Um, Although there are other faiths that inhabit the world, I mentioned several earlier, Christendom is the belief that we're in an era, a period in religious history in which Christianity is the dominant faith and that Christians, um, in essence, are the chosen people and that the, the mission of Christians is to spread Christianity around the world so that all persons might become Christian. It's... um. Like I said, falling out of favor, especially in this time where the majority of people, I believe we can safely say that over half the population in America at least, is um, non-religious. 
or um, not Christian for sure. And we can say that um, in Russia, um, a significant percent of Russians are what they call Orthodox Christians. The stats I read say that 63% of the population identifies as Orthodox Christian, um, 7% identify as Muslim, practicing Islam, while another 26% report they don't have any religious faith whatsoever. I would highlight that even in America where it's safe to say that 45 to 50% of the people would say that they're religious and perhaps Christian. There's a significant portion of those who are not, or let me rephrase that, there's a significant portion of those people who we call nominal Christians, meaning that they aspire to be Christian or they say that they are a Christian in belief. They probably believe in God or have some sense of being in a relationship with Jesus. But if you ask them whether they attend church or whether they have a regular religious practice, maybe prayer or some other spiritual discipline or whether they read the Bible frequently or have ever read the Bible, many of them would say no. They're not connected in that way. Many are connected through, say, their ancestors, their parents or grandparents. Perhaps were people of deep faith and attended church and they may have the individuals themselves attended Sunday school and gone to church as youth and children, but have long since given up those practices. So this notion of restoring Christendom is probably one that many people would be shocked to, under, to understand or hear that in the back of um, Vladimir Putin's mind, he's also using this attack on Ukraine as a way of restoring Christendom. It's not um, impossible to envision being that um, Zelensky, the president, President Zelensky of Ukraine, is Jewish and um, speaks Russian. You might say that he is um, one who has a Russian Jewish descent. And for Putin, that could be a threat or some motivation um, behind the insurgency that we've just seen in Ukraine. So not only is he trying to, that is um, Vladimir Putin, not only is he trying to restore Russian power and a Soviet Union type of stature for Russia and its um, countries under its wing, he's also trying to restore a sense of Christendom with Russia at its center. These are pretty disturbing um, facts to come to grips with in 2022. Um, we live in a world that is largely uh, peaceful, depending on you know where you sit in America. Um, right now, we are global power, and we have troops. Differences that allows us to understand that conflict is resol resolvable and need not be the type of conflict that causes devastation or destruction. But on the world scene, um, conflict that we see now is causing destruction and there are going to be um, hundreds, thousands of lives that will be um, lost in this war. I saw some numbers this morning that showed that there were a um, few, um, less than a hundred, I would say, Ukrainian soldiers that were killed. There were um, helicopters down, drones down, um, few civilian deaths so far. But as you can imagine, as the shelling into Kiev becomes more intense, there will be more deaths on the ground. And as they get closer to the um, governing bodies, the structures that contain the presidency and the um, legislatures, the government there, there are going to be more deaths. And this is what conflict is all about. So I wonder, why is it that 
when you are attending a house of worship, um, you hear so little about the realities around us and the realities being today um, this war between Ukraine and Russia and the American response, which I haven't um, broached yet. But if you're listening and watching, you know that America has responded fairly briskly, uh, much more briskly than what took place in 2014 uh, when they, when the Russians um, annexed Crimea. Uh, we said that we were going to have a pretty strong response if Vladimir Putin annexed or invaded Crimea. In fact, um, our response was not nearly as um, robust as it has been this time around. So what has taken place? Um, the president and American, American president and the allies have already um, initiated sanctions against Russia. Um, they have cut off um, the pipeline not cut off the pipeline, but they have um, delayed a process of certifying a pipeline that goes into Russia, gas pipeline. They have um, sanctioned Russian's oligarchs. That would be people in power who are um, company leaders. Oligarchs tend to be people who are rich and wealthy. They basically um, control power in addition to controlling the companies that they run. And they are the consummate insiders um, living on the country and the backs of the people. So in this case, um, they have sanctioned um, Putin's sons, family members who are known to have um, enormous assets and resources that control much of the Russian populace. So they're putting the pain on people who are in power. Um, most noticeably, they are, sanctions have been drawn against um, Russia's three largest banks. The idea here is to cut them off from the uh, American and the European financial markets. And that, in, its, in essence, will eliminate their ability to conduct trade uh, in the global markets. So the sanctions are pretty heavy. Um, the heaviest, of course, would be to shut off Russian energy exports. This is where um, Russia earns revenues that run its government and much of the country. So if the Ukrainians, well Ukrainians can't do it, but if the um, American government and its allies in Europe were to come together and the UN and decide to sanction Russian energy exports, that probably would be the one that Putin and Russia would feel the most. Of course, the downside of all these sanctions is that they're going to cause some pain on the Americans and its allies and um, Ukraine's allies also. So it won't be a pain-free set of circumstances that we're laying down on Russia, but one that is intended to bring enough pain that they withdraw this military action. I believe it would be very helpful if Americans who are people of faith could find within themselves or find somehow understand the need to be vocal and to speak out about these actions that we see on the geopolitical scene. As a Unitarian Universalist, I know that me and my colleagues are fairly vocal and they'll be this Sunday offering words of comfort and assurance around Unitarian Universalist principles and values of um, freedom and democracy and the interdependence or interconnectedness of all people and things in the world. That is to say that uh, we are not isolated as Unitarian Universalists nor are we isolated as Americans who are living on the other side of the globe and where the hostilities are taking place right now. So we 
can speak out and we can write to our congresspersons, our senators and president and our world leaders to say, hey, this is our position on what is taking place and this is how we believe that the U.S. ought to respond. I believe that the current administration deserves kudos for its quick and swift response. Um, one thing that we haven't mentioned so far is that the other world power that is standing um, by itself watching all this play out is China. And I read this morning in the New York Times that the Biden administration made many overtures to China and its president to step in and to try to get Vladimir Putin or to persuade Vladimir Putin to stand down but China has refused to make such intercessions, um, which is understandable. Um, China is a partner with Russia, and they have similar um, political ambitions, and they are similarly organized as um, autocrats in the world, and you would expect that China would probably not take any position to try to stultify the actions that Putin has initiated over the last several months. But we too, as Americans, um, can stand up and say to our world leaders, our national leaders, that um, keep on the pressure and to keep standing up for democracy. Um, I believe people of faith have that responsibility, especially Americans, whether you're a Christian, Jew, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, or any other faith to be aware that as people of faith we are not isolated from world events and that our voices matter also. Let me take a break here and say that you're listening to Take on Faith on KTAL LP 101.5 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm your host Kalani Kachela. I am a Unitarian Universalist minister and you can find my work in addition to this program at revdrxk.com. That's R-E-V as in Rev, D-R as in Dr, X-K as in Kalani Kachela, dot com. Um, there you'll find um, my books, um, Jumpstart Your Allyship, The Black View Use Survival Guide, and others. Um, and I encourage you to go to my website and check out what I'm doing. I'm um, trying to be a voice of positivity in the world. And I'm trying to bring a sense of um, free thinking and enlightenment um, to this community. And to you know, find ways to keep understanding the world and how faith impacts the world. And how people of faith can impact the world. Um, this program itself... Take on Faith is one that invites a variety of voices from all spiritual traditions to come and speak. I've had um, authors from a variety of um, traditions, being um, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, people who practice magic, those who practice Reiki, those who um, are Jewish, who have written books about their lives and how they understand the world and how religion has impacted them. So I invite you to um, go to our website here at KTALLP, which would be lccommunity.org. That's LC as in Las Cruces, community.org. And here are um, some of the archive programs from Take on Faith. You can also listen to those podcasts on my website. Um, https colon slash slash revdrxk dot com and you can hear past episodes from the beginning of this program up until the current date um, podcasts are also available on Spotify Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts and wherever you might get your podcasts look for Take On Faith So getting back to the situation of Russia and Ukraine and how 
people of faith might respond. I know when I grew up, and this has taken me back um, to my early days of attending churches and going to Sunday school. I'm 60 years old now, so I've had a lot of time um, immersed in the life of the church. I can hardly ever think of any case where um, I heard a preacher talk about any world events or even national events. And my sense is that the way preachers are taught to expound upon faith is one in which they separate local events, um, national events, world events from the church. It's as if the church is kind of cloistered away from the rest of the world. And these things are not necessarily foreign, but I believe that the, the way preachers understand scriptures is that they see these as powers beyond the human world. They're kind of powers in the um, world beyond. I can't think of the exact words in the book right now, but if you read the Bible or read other sacred texts, you'll see that these are words that are described in certain writings in the Bible as um, powers that kind of transcend human power. And as a, sort, as a result, humans kind of look to God or other supernatural forces to be in control of these events. That is a typical response, I believe, that you will hear from uh, most clergy persons. Um, exceptions being people such as um, those who are deeply involved in um, social justice and human rights and civil freedoms, especially in America. There's a deep tradition of preachers who do speak of human freedoms. Um, we saw this throughout the civil rights movement. We see it now in light of the racial killings by police throughout the country where clergy are standing up and creating coalitions to get out and speak and to protest and to um, call police departments and mayors and county and government officials to respond with justice against people who are committing crimes against Americans um, innocently out there living their lives. But these world events seem to elude clergy. And my sense is that there could be a couple of reasons for this, a few reasons, if you would. One, um, having attended two seminaries myself, um, one in Dallas, SMU, Perkins School of Theology, and one in Fort Worth, Wright Divinity School, where I earned my Master's of Divinity and PhD. There's just um, little spoken in those walls about politics. Um, we can go to lecture after lecture, day after day, and few theological religious scholars will say anything about the political world that's taking place around them. It's as if the world in the seminary is its own world and nothing beyond that world exists that we ought to be concerned with. So when you attend church on Sunday and you listen to a preacher expecting to hear a word about the political situation and you hear none, well, that could be very well the reason is that they're untrained or trained not to speak out about politics or any other situation that goes on around them. I've often been to church and thought, this is something that is impacting our world, whether it be um, a civil rights issue or a geopolitical issue. And I'm saying to myself, I wonder why this person is not addressing this issue, not even in the prayer. It's as if it doesn't even exist. I believe another reason might be that clergy persons may find that their work is separate from the current events of the day, meaning that they have their heads buried in scriptures and other sacred texts, and they may not see a need to open the paper and to um, read what is going on the headlines. And if they do, they may not feel compelled to 
find some connection between the papers of the day and the papers of the ancient world, meaning the books of the Bible or other scriptural text. Um, surely there is a connection and to the extent that um, sacred texts encourage us to be aware and be present in the moment and to be hopeful would suggest that those texts were written by people who were aware that there were forces around them that threatened the lives of those adherents that they need to be aware of. But it is um, a difficult task to try to get your head around something like the Russian-Ukrainian war that's going on right now and try to understand it in terms that the average layperson um, may understand it. Or, let me rephrase that, it could be difficult to get your mind around what are the causes and the forces behind the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine as a clergy person and then task yourself with explaining it to your flock or to your congregation in a way that helps them understand the significance of it and helps them understand that they have some obligation to understand it as global citizens. Um, it takes time to sit down and just indulge yourself in reading about a current conflict and all the various aspects of it and then try to figure out some way to um, distill that down to the essence that can be spoken to, say, in less than um, five minutes on a Sunday morning because um, that's about all you're going to have if you're in a typical um, Anglo-American church. If you're an African-American church where sermons last an hour, sometimes an hour and 15 minutes, you have much longer to talk about it. But still, um, as an African-American clergy myself, I haven't grown up in African-American church. I've been to many, many Baptist churches, Methodist churches also, and churches of Christ and other denominations where there's a long sermon by a African-American clergy and not a single word was rendered about the current situation. It's all about faith and salvation and how do we prepare for the afterlife. So that task of getting your mind wrapped around that topic and bring it to your flock in a way that's intelligent, concise, and attention-getting, as well as um, raising awareness that we all have a responsibility in this matter, is difficult. So that's the second thing. The third thing is, is there a correct response for people of faith in these matters and do clergy persons learn whether they attend seminary or they're called by God from some other place and trained um, strictly at the local level do they have some sense of what a response of people of faith might be and I think this is where the rubber really hits the road is how do clergy persons and adherents of various faiths understand what a response, a correct response, might be to these situations. And this requires us to do the deep work. That is, it requires us to, one, know our own principles and values about the world, have those clearly defined in our hearts and minds so we understand when those principles and values are being challenged which in, its sense, in essence means that we as human beings are being challenged. And then um, doing the deep work of just thinking it through. You know, what are the consequences of war? What are the consequences of us as Americans um, watching the war take place? And what can we do um, as people of faith watching these situations go by? Um, there are many things that we can do. We could contribute to um, organizations that provide um, humanitarian relief. Um, we, as people of faith, often belong to traditions that have their own social justice arms, such as um, in Unitarian Universalism, we have a College of Social Justice, and there are many 
other organizations within the faith that contribute to hum humanitarian relief. So we could, of course, always send money. We could um, join these organizations and send goods, and we could send um, food, and we can send clothes, and you know, we could send other resources that help people who are living in these conditions that are rapidly declining. So there are things that we can do, but we do have to think it through. It's just not written somewhere that people of faith have a standard response, um, and that is what we're going to do because it's been handed down to us from people on high. I believe each individual has their own obligation to understand the situation at hand best they can, uh, spend the time to think about it, think it through, and ask themselves what is their responsibility in the current conflict and how can they respond? How do they get their families involved? How do they get their friends involved? How do they get their spiritual communities involved? How do they go about bringing to bear um, within their communities of faith just a conversation about what's going on, which we tend not to see. So I'm asking you um, to open your eyes and to think these things through as a person of faith, if that is who you are, if you're a person of free thinking and free thought. This is also a chance for you to pay some attention to you know, where you stand on the issues and how do you understand your role, even as a secular person, one who believes in science and other human traditions versus spiritual and religious traditions, how can you respond and how can you offer the world the gifts and graces that you bring to bear, that your life has led you to bring to the current moment? I have spent a fair amount of time talking about this um, with my spouse. Um, we've been watching the TV together. We've been trying to understand the situation together. And as people have called me on the phone, in a few, I've tried to have a conversation about it with people so that, um, you know, for my part, I can say that I'm not burying my head in the sand and acting as if it doesn't exist, this situation in Russia and Ukraine. In fact, when you turn the news on, it is the breaking news every day. Yet we do find ways as as individuals to act as if it's not the breaking news. You know, we would prefer to see other things that are much much happier. Um, having just seen the Olympics, for example, which was the breaking news for about three weeks before the the war actually broke out. We love to hear about gold medals and silver medals and bronze medals and all the ways that human beings have risen through tragedy to become the world's greatest athletes. And that is a great story for us to delve our delve into and to um, learn from and to you know gain strength from and community around that. I mean, we had a, a great time talking to people about the Olympics and the new events that were taking place during this year's Olympics. On the other hand, we had this reality that war is taking place and that U.S. troops are involved. Um, the president has called up um, troops that are stationed in Europe and has sent some American um, forces over to um, Ukraine or in the space around Ukraine to serve as peacekeepers and serve as advisors and to help shore up those Ukrainian forces and those are the allies. So we are in fact involved and we will remain involved in very vital ways. So it is incumbent upon all of us to try to think about these things as people of faith and understand that we have a responsibility to respond, at least to be aware of it. And this is a good time to perhaps do some personal accountability to Try to look at ourselves in a mirror and see what are our values and principles and what are they calling us to do in this day and how do we understand it as people of faith. Perhaps we can call upon our leaders to make mention of these events in their sermons and their homilies 
uh, when they're preaching on Sundays in the, in the weeks to come and to let us know, you know, what are their thoughts and what are their, what does their theology say to them about how they might respond? How might they teach us to respond in ways that are in alignment with what we say we believe on a daily basis. So these are a few things I want to leave you with today. Again, this is Kalani Kachela, XK, and you've been listening to Take on Faith, talking about the Ukrainian and Russian situation that is with us now and how we as people of faith can respond. You can find me at XK at revdrxk.com or you can simply email me at kalani.kachela at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Take care. Be well. You've been listening to Take On Faith on KTALLP FM 101.5 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. If you have comments about today's program, please email me at xk at rev drxk.com Be sure to get vaccinated. Wear your mask and stay safe out there. I'm your host, Kalani Kuchela.